Welcome to Family Bible Time. We are in Job. Job. So, for the next month and a few days, we're going to be um, into one of the most amazing books in the Bible. It's actually, you could say, the oldest book in the Bible, probably written around the same time as Genesis. Um, it's not really certain, but it's it's old, old, old in its setting. Mm -hmm. When it was written, um, makes sense that it was Job that wrote it, or a contemporary of Job that wrote it. It was certainly way, way back <clears throat> in its setting when Job, the time that Job lived, mm -hmm. is a is the, what's called the patriarchal period. Mm. And so we're going to get some insight into a different world than the one we've just been living in in Esther. Oh, yeah. Yeah, go for it. Let's, we need to pray. We're also in Romans chapter 5, which is just mm. wonderful. So um, let's pray. Let's go. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for your kindness. Thank you that you're in charge of everything that... Um, Lord, you have just been so gracious to us to bless us and to um, provide spiritual nourishment day by day. We pray that you do that this evening. We pray for your help. Uh, we pray that you would lead us in the truth, that you deliver us from evil. Please deliver us from our own tendencies to go astray. Uh, please correct us. Please... Lord, where we're wrong, show us by your word, we pray. And lead us in the truth, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, there was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Now, before we go any further, maybe you know the story of Job, and this is you're, you're going to be tempted at some points to join in with those who attack Job and accuse him of not being blameless and upright, accuse him of having some kind of sin that, um, and, and certainly he didn't respond in the right way at different times in this story, but you just have to notice in verse 1, this is, you would say, divine commentary on the life of Job. This is God's verdict. Initially on the life of Job, does blameless mean sinless? No. Does upright mean, mean perfect? Of course not. But blameless and upright are descriptions of someone who is walking with the Lord. And, and that's then the description, one who feared God. He did fear God and he turned away from evil. So this is a repentant man. This is a man who's trusting the Lord. Now verse 2, there were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke, that's a pair of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. So I think he had an eye for symmetry as well. I mean, <laughs> that's a thousand oxen. And that's, by the way, a thousand oxen is like a mega farmer. Mm. So what can you plow with a thousand oxen? Mm. That's a lot, isn't it? 500 yoke of oxen and 500 female donkeys. Imagine even having enough land to grow enough food to feed those animals. Mm. It's just unbelievable. 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels. Mm. Well, 7,000 sheep is, yeah, you can kind of picture that with a few nice sheepdogs. <laughs> well, they used sheepdogs, but you can kind of picture that, can't you? 7,000 sheep roaming on on the hillside. A few mm. few shepherds maybe to look after the 
got 3,000 camels. What do you do with them? <laughs> well, of course, this probably, he talks later about tents, it's probably kind of a nomadic mm -hmm. um, Bedouin, maybe like lifestyle, a little bit like Abraham and his travels. So you, you've got someone perhaps who is moving with, I imagine all those camels for transport, maybe we know about camels for military purposes, don't we? We watched Lawrence of Arabia and we saw him galloping along on his camels. <laughs> is that embarrassing that you watched Lawrence of Arabia? It can't be. No, it was just really sad. <laughs> it, was just really, it was really, really sad, wasn't it? So anyway, that's a lot of camels. Female donkeys. I don't know why you didn't like male donkeys, but <laughs> 500 female donkeys. And very many servants. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. So obviously this is before there were kings. And this is in the, maybe the patriarchal period. He's not called King Job. But that's kind of how you can think of him. It's like mm. a really righteous ruler. Very many servants. Okay. Um, so that this man was the grace of all the people of the East. His sons used to go to and hold a feast in, in the house of each one on his day. Maybe his birthday. And unless it was like seven days a week. Seven sons and... <laughs> one for Monday, one for Tuesday, one for Wednesday. So maybe they just were continually feasting each other's houses. I don't know. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offering according to the number of them all. For Job said, maybe it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now, please notice, those of you who are children, notice the care and concern. This is right, isn't it? Mm. Let me just say, when you grow up and have your own children, if you love the Lord, you're going to have this same concern for them. Oh, I don't want my children to sin. Mm. I don't want my children to curse God in their hearts. Oh, Lord, please forgive them. Please have mercy upon them. You'll be praying for them like this. Mm. Thus Job did continually. He's always just thinking about the, the Lord and his children and, and his great desire is for his children to be saved. That's it. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to be present. So came to present <laughs> themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. Now, who are the sons of God, or Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, put together with the New Testament teaching. It's very difficult to work it out from Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. But in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, there's the same phrase used of the sons of God and having relations with the daughters of men and producing an an, uh, a generation of offspring that were kind of giants. The Nephilim, mighty men of old. So um, it's quite possible, and I think it's biblically the best solution to say that these sons of God were actually the, the angels, both fallen angels, and the angels um, and good angels. The sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, who's the chief of the fallen angels, also came among them. In other words, this is a time when there's this kind of, I suppose you'd say, day of accountability. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? From where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless 
an upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. What's wrong? How have you had that up for a while? <laughs> I'm not going to say my vision is in <laughs> I was just looking down. I just managed to squirt. Oh, I managed to get a, a whole big drip of WD-40 in my eye. <laughs> and have had my eye under a cold tap for a while. <laughs> so, um, yes. Um, what was Satan's name before he got his name Satan? Oh, that's a good question. So he is called in the Bible Lucifer. Um, I, is I that don't. Mean snake? No, I think Lucifer is like something to do with light. Uh, I can't remember. Um, but I don't know. Bright. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's probably best to just leave it like that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember. I'm sure we can look it up though. That's what a good Bible dictionary is for. You can read an article about it and you'll know more than your dad. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, did you just notice... Look, who, who brought up Job, by mm, the way? It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's like God brings up Job. You think, well, who's starting this contest? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? In the court, in the halls of heaven, there's something is going on. There's a there's a conflict. Hmm. And Satan answered the Lord and said, "Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side?" No, he's not talking about a literal hedge. But what does that mean? A hedge would be protection. Actually, people used to plant hedges as protection. It's quite difficult to climb through a hedge. Mm. We build fences, don't we? Um, hedges are actually better protection than a fence. It was harder to get through a hedge. But um, well, Satan is just saying, don't, haven't you protected him? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in, in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he'll curse you to your face. Now that's a challenge, isn't it? That's God. The Satan saying to God, yeah, your servants, they don't really like you. They just, they just bless you because you're good to them. Well, that's a challenge. Um, you could say in verse 12, God says, okay, challenge accepted. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand, only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now that's the background, and now we're going to see what Satan does when Satan is allowed to. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were ploughing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, that means still speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Well, he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they're dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. All right. Stop just there for a second. Keep your finger there. 
That's a bad day, isn't it, for Job? It's like a day like no other, is it? I mean, yeah. it, it, this doesn't, it almost doesn't compute so mm. much disaster mm. in one day. Mm. And all of them saying the same thing. All of them coming with almost the same words. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And it's like, well, what is this? Oh, this is obviously the hand of God, isn't it? Is this not a random accident? Is that much stuff doesn't happen in one day. To, uh, to, to one person, with everyone saying the same thing, just, I mean, the chances are beyond impossible. And so this, this is like a, a message to Job that this is, this is supernatural. And when I, say, I say the hand of God, obviously it's the hand of Satan. But God obviously has allowed it. God has allowed Satan to do all of this. And that raises some pretty big questions, doesn't it? I mean, like, why? Why would God allow Satan to afflict Job like this? I mean, this is taking the lives of his children, his servants, taking away all his property, ruining him. Why would God let Satan do that? Why would God give permission for it? And, and there's no way out, by the way, of of saying that that is exactly what this text says because you remember back at the beginning it's satan it's god who says to satan behold verse 12 all that he has is in your hand and it's god that restrains satan only against him do not stretch out your hand and so we say who's in charge here god Satan can't do it without permission, can he? How many times have you heard that from your parents? Just again and again and again and again and again. Look, when bad things happen to us, we've got to know that this is... Satan can't do this without permission. This may be from the hand of Satan. We don't always know, do we? But when bad things happen, he can't do it without permission. So therefore, we can trust that God knows what he's doing. And we can trust that because we know the character of God. And because we've read the end of the book of Job. So, <clears throat> look, if you don't know yet whether you personally could trust God if he let bad things happen in your life, well, this is where we're going to learn about it. This is so helpful because we get to see something of the character of God and something of the purposes of God, although one of the big lessons in the book of Job is God never explains why. <laughs> we get some insight. Look, there's a kind of a contest going on here in the background. There is more going on in the background in this book than meets the eye. And it's a, a spiritual conflict it's not not so much a contest there is no contest but it's a conflict satan is accusing god satan is at war with god satan hates god and because of that he hates the servants of god satan is longing to bring evil into the life of God's servants like Job and, and, and Satan is, is longing to get Job to hate God like he hates God mm. that's just some of the background now imagine there was someone that hated me or <laughs> mummy let's, say, let's pick on mummy let's say, imagine that someone hated mummy and let's imagine that someone came into your life and tried to persuade you to hate mummy. Well, that's just wicked, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But why would they be doing that? Would they be doing that to try to get at mummy? 
it would be one of those really weird things in life. And by the way, in real life, sometimes that does happen. People just copy Satan at this point and try to get one person to join with them in their hatred against someone else. But I'm just pointing out that behind the scenes in this, in all this trouble, behind the scenes is Satan in his war against God. And Job is kind of caught up in that. But he's not caught up in it by mistake. He's not caught up in it against the will of God. He's caught up in it by the will of God. God allows it. That means God wills it. It doesn't mean it's God's, um, you would say, moral will. This is not this is not good, this is evil, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But it, it is God's um, permissive will. This is God what, what God allows. Mm -hmm. And in that we have to say, um, if God wills it, then that, what can we do but accept it? Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I appreciate the fact that in all of this, it's very obvious that that's what's happening. By the way it all happens, Job can tell this is from none other than the hand of God. Now, mm -hmm. how do I know that? Also, look at verse 20. Look at Job's amazing response. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave. And the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now that is really great, isn't it? That's where that song comes from. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Mm. You give and take away. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. That's copying Job, isn't it? Mm. Now look at verse 22. This is awesome. This verse changed our life, didn't it? There's no exaggeration to say that in the worst possible time in our lives, a time when we could have been just broken in grief and fear and broken at our own loss, God held us from this by this verse. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. To, with wrong. Mm. In all this, imagine it. You think you, think you have things bad? Mm. Friend, <laughs> mm. you just got to come here and say, look, Job had it worse, but he didn't sin. He, and why didn't he sin? Because he didn't charge God with doing wrong. When he didn't charge God with doing wrong, what was he saying? He's saying, God, you know what you're doing. Mm. I don't know what you're doing, but you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's faith, isn't it? By the way, if you like Spurgeon's sermons, maybe you've never read a Spurgeon sermon, can I recommend that you dig out the Spurgeon sermon on Job 122? Mm. Because it was reading that sermon on this verse. That saved us mm. at a time when we could have really sinned, but we didn't. Praise the Lord. The Lord kept us, didn't He? Mm. Yeah. He's kept us ever since. This truth, by the way, becomes an anchor for your soul. Mm -hmm. It becomes something which you can just cling to, mm. whatever happens. Oh, so. Maybe someone will post a link to Spurgeon's sermon on Psalm, on Job one twenty two in the notes below. <laughs> now, I'm supposed to say, by the way, I, I'm such a bad YouTuber. I'm supposed to say, please hit the subscribe button. Because if you subscribe, <laughs> then for some reason it does something weird, weird with the algorithms in YouTube. So the more people subscribe, the more, the more people see it. But I don't know whether... I mean, so many different people have been blessed, not just in our church, but around the world, 
apparently if you hit subscribe, then more people see it and then more people get to be blessed. So hit subscribe. Oh. Oh. Uh, that's about as much YouTubing as I can do. All right. Romans chapter five. Therefore. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, since we have... You're supposed to have a bell, aren't you, when you hit, say hit subscribe. Can you do the bell? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, back to sense now. Um, <coughs> therefore, since we have been justified by faith, oh, that'll do me. She needs a tissue. Should we try again? Yep. Romans chapter 5. <laughs> therefore, since we have been justified by faith, Right, as in not by works, but by faith, justified, declare righteous with God's sight. By faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that is golden. Yeah, why do you need peace with God? Why? Well, because not, it's not just Satan who's at war with God, is it? It's every rebel sinner who's also at war with God. And when you're a rebel and you're a sinner, God is against you. God is actually going to judge you. God has wrath with you. And you need to be at peace with him. How does that peace come? Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Now verse 2, through him, through Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out, poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Mm. Now, if you think that that sounds a bit like Yoda, mm -hmm. it's because you've been listen, watching too much Star Wars and not reading the Bible enough. You see, Yoda sounded a bit more like this, didn't he? No, I can't remember. You know, fear produces hate and... Ang anger uh -huh. and so on, you know. Um, that's kind of the world according to Yoda. But this is this is a whole different world, isn't it? More than that, we we rejoice in our sufferings. How can you rejoice? I mean, Job didn't accuse God of wrongdoing. That's one level, isn't it? But rejoicing in our sufferings? How? Well, this is how. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been brought out to us. Listen, when, see, when you're suffering as a Christian, when you're suffering having been justified, you're at peace with God, but you're at peace with God, but God is allowing you to suffer? I mean, how is it? Well, that's... Suffering according to God's will, isn't it? It's, it's obviously, God has allowed it. God has allowed it for a reason. Not for no reason. And one reason, we, we don't get all the reasons that God allows the suffering. We'll see that in Job. But one reason we do know is God is at work in us. So when you're suffering, you know that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And that's good. <laughs> so listen, if you're suffering and you're trusting in God, something good is coming out of it. You know that. And so, so you can rejoice if you trust God. Um, verse 6. For while we were still weak. What's he talking about now? He's talking about before he was saved. At the right time, God, uh, sorry, Christ died for the ungodly. 
For scarcely will one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we've now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we, we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Reconciliation is a great thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. When two people are enemies and then they're reconciled, they're at peace again. And that's the picture, by the way, of you and I when we're saved. Before you're saved, you're an enemy of God. Some people really don't like that. They don't like to believe that. They don't like to believe that we're all somehow at peace with God, naturally, and God just loves us all like a kind of a spiritual Santa Claus who looks down from heaven and says, ho, 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 <laughs> and, and just wants to kind of give everyone presents. Mm. Actually, God is a holy judge, and you're a wretched sinner, and God is, uh, is God has wrath with you, and God is a just judge, and he's going to punish you, and you're rebelling against God, saying, no, I won't do what you say I should do, and you're saying, yes, I will do uh, what you say I shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. This morning I went into London on the tube, and there was a mother, I think it was a mother, maybe a nanny, with two little girls. And one of them had her feet on the seats opposite. She was about ten. She sat there like this. My mother had been trying to tell her not to put her feet on the seats. And she just refused the whole way. It was all I could do to restrain myself <laughs> from going over there and <laughs> teaching her that she needed to obey her mother. Wow. <laughs> You'd have never got away with that, would you, girl? <laughs> nope. But, nope. But that's what we're like, isn't it? We're like the stubborn, rebellious... <laughs> children that say to God no I will have my feet on the seats mm. that makes you God's enemy listen it makes you God's enemy God is not going to sit there and do nothing God is going to sort you out you're in big trouble so look but when you repent when you go to God and ask for forgiveness I saw it we're out of sound, aren't we? I need to hurry up. I'm not going to skip this bit. Listen, you need this more than anything else. When you repent and you go to God and you ask for forgiveness, you're reconciled to him. So instead of having been his enemy, you're now his friend. And how is that? Well, verse 10 explains it beautifully. If while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. That's the gospel, isn't it? That's salvation. Now he builds on it. Much, um, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So we're reconciled by his death, saved by his life. He was raised from the dead. Um so we can rejoice <laughs> look at that more than that we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we've now received reconciliation so let me just ask you are you rejoicing in God this is really good isn't it verse 12 therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin it's talking about the fall and Adam and so death spread to all men because all sinned for indeed 
For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there's no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. By the way, if you can understand that, well done. That's one of the most difficult passages in the whole Bible. Um, but the free grift is not like the trespass. If, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by that, the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. If because of one man's trespass, death, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification for and life for all men. And as by for as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death. Grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Mm. Wow. Uh -huh. By the way, this is one of the most theologically packed, dense, mm. difficult passages in the, in the Bible. It's really, some of it, like verse 12, is the kind of thing which is so debated in theological circles You've almost got to become a theologian to get through all the stuff that's <laughs> written on it. And um, I'm not going to even attempt to explain it right now. Mm. What I will point you to is just one gorgeous truth mm. in verse 17. It's just in this phrase. We're going we're gonna, to we're see it again later as a thought. In chapter 10 but this phrase the free gift of righteousness this is what theologians have called the doctrine of imputed righteousness what does it mean to be righteous it means well um, God looks at you and says you're right <laughs> there's 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 righteousness that God wants in us. You say positively, God wants us to actually do the right thing. God wants us to obey the law. God wants us to... to, to there are many things that we're supposed to do that we don't do, aren't, aren't there? And, and you can say, there's one thing to say, let, let's, for, let's ask God to forgive us all our sins. Where does that leave you? It leaves you like, if this was your bank account, if this was, talking, we're talking about money, and you say, well, forgive us our debts, forgive us all our sins, God. Where does that get you to? That gets you to zero. That doesn't leave you any spiritual righteousness, any spiritual money in your account. But now that we're talking about this free gift of righteousness, theologians talk about the imputed righteousness of Christ. So this is when God takes righteousness that belongs to Jesus because he died, he made it available, and, and, and God credits it. God puts it into our account. God treats me as if I had done the righteous things Jesus did. Mm. Now, this really helps you, by the way, because I, I remember the day when I, re-captured this doctrine after some time of not thinking about it and I'd begun to really struggle I was like you know how can I pray what about my sins I'm such a such a failure such a wretch 
um, God can't be pleased with me. Well, all of that's true. <laughs> um, but God is pleased with me. We say, how can God be pleased with you, Tom? You still fail. Well, yes, but God is looking at me and he's seeing me as if I had the righteousness of Jesus. Not as if I had the righteousness of Jesus, but in reality, I do have the righteousness of Jesus mm. applied to me. So God isn't doing a trick. God is actually giving righteousness as a gift. Do you imagine if you, you could have someone else's exam results? <laughs> <laughs> and you could just like, chemistry. I got it. <laughs> I just aced chemistry. How? Oh, someone else did it. And they gave it to me. That's what this is like. So this is righteousness. So did you do all those righteous things, Tom? No, I didn't. I didn't do it. I was a failure. At every level. I never matched up to God's righteousness. I could never do one thing as perfectly as God wants it done. Mm -hmm. I can't. I just, I'm a, I'm a sinner. But here comes God and he says, I'm giving you righteousness. Well then, if you give me righteousness, then I can be righteous mm -hmm. in your eyes. So can I pray? You better can. I can pray because of the righteousness mm. that God gives. So there's a lot in that one phrase, isn't there? The free gift of righteousness. Wow. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that that may be true of each one of us. And we beg you to enable us to trust you for it and to live in the light of it, to pray in the light of it, to serve you out of love, not out of any attempt to measure up in your sight. Thank you that you've fixed that once and for all at the cross. And when you justify us, Lord, we praise you, we love you, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're done. God bless you. I'm sorry it was a bit longer, but I hope you enjoyed Job. Whoever put Job 1 and Romans 5 together, genius. God bless you. See you tomorrow.